Will you please stand with us and join together as we sing our first song of worship. Thank you. 
I just have a few announcements. So we're on call this month, you know. If you, it's okay. <laughs> I know she was. So <laughs> you can just tell she was so excited about doing this today. Let us now join together in this morning's call and response prayer, which is from Psalm 65, verses 1 through 8. Praise is due to you, O God, in Zion. O you who answer prayer. When deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, Happy are those whom you choose and bring near. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house. By awesome deeds you answer us with deliverance. You are the hope of all the ends of the earth. By your strength you establish the mountains. You silence the roaring of the seas. Those who live at Earth's farthest bounds are awed by your signs. Amen. Let's join together with our next song of worship.
so you could, we could get to know you better. And of course, pray for all your prayer requests. Um, we do have life, life groups, um, discipleship and fellowship. Sunday morning. How's everybody doing? I'm on this beach and it is filled with all this little stuff. Do you guys know what this stuff is? Yeah, I just scream it out, right? Sand, yeah. It is so little and so fine. It's amazing, right? And today, downstairs, we are talking about the kingdom of God and little, little, little bitty things, right? We're talking about some seeds and some stuff you put in some food to make some stuff that is what we're talking about so so this is jojo i'll see you guys downstairs all right it's beautiful guys all right
news of your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is so great is our God. You are the God who works wonders. You have displayed your mighty among the peoples. With strong arm you redeem your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph, Salah. When the waters saw you, O oh God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. They were very, very deep trembled. The clouds poured out water, and the skies thundered. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the mighty waters. Let your footprints, your, yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. The second scripture is from Philippians 4 and 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Thank you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everybody. So good to have you all here today. So in this psalm we just read, a very interesting, mysterious, and beautiful word came up, and that is the word Selah. Selah shows up throughout the psalms, and it shows up in one of the prophets, but it's this kind of unusual word that no one really understands the meaning of. But essentially, what we kind of believe is that Selah is an instruction to the people reading to stop, reflect, and think. Because what was just said was really, really important. Now, I think it's interesting that we have to be told to stop and think about something, right? You're reading scripture, you're singing a song, because that's what the psalms originally were. And you have to be told, hey, pay attention to what you're actually saying in this moment. And interesting enough, in that psalm, that passage that was just read, it is describing what Selah is itself regarding the wonders and works of God. And so it's interesting here because the psalmist uh, is asking us to Selah on his Selah of God's goodness. It's like a Selah inception kind of thing going on here, right? And today, this is kind of what I just want to talk about. It's just the importance of meditating and reflecting on the goodness of God and why we need to stop and reflect. I want us to stop and meditate on the fact that we need to meditate. It's funny, we are often extremely fickle creatures that need to be reminded of everything, right? How easily do we forget? How you know? There's there was this literal study done that showed that you know uh, our brain is like uh, for good things our brain is like Teflon, and for negative things it's like Velcro. A hundred good things could be said about you, a hundred compliments, a hundred good jobs, and it will just bounce off, and your brain will not hold it. But one negative comment. One criticism, one small little thing, and it sticks to us. No matter how much good happens, we always remember the bad thing. A thousand people can tell you how amazing you are, how good of a job you're doing, how good of a person, how good of a parent, how good of a coworker you are. And yet that one person, that one slight criticism, it's going to be the thing that sticks in your mind. And so when it comes to the goodness of God, once again, just like any other good thing, it doesn't always stick super well. 
We constantly have to remember, and we have to be reminded to remember. You see, memory is such a powerful thing. Essentially, all the decisions we make, everything we do in our life, every uh, choice we make, we all base and, uh, and everything we act upon is all because of memory. We may not realize it. It's a little more subconscious. But we all know the phrase, uh, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, me and if you're a certain president, uh, shame me, fool me, third time, will fool me again. Uh, you know, uh, that's a millennial joke. Okay, Kim got it. Thanks again. I was debating whether or not I was going to do that, and we see why I shouldn't write jokes. But no, we all act on memory. Everything we do has to do with our memory. And we generally act out of how our body and mind interprets previous experiences, and we adjust for the future. You see, our bodies themselves hold memory as well. You know, anyone in here who's ever played sports, I played hockey uh, for like 12 years. I know, I'm just like the strongest, biggest person in the world. It's <laughs> obvious that I... Play hockey, uh, but we play hockey, and the whole idea in sports is what you do the same action over and over and over again, and you're not necessarily doing it to get better. You hit a certain point to where kind of you are going to get as good as you get, and at that point, you're just taking the same shot over and over for one thing and one thing only, and that is to gain muscle memory. says Salem. Pay attention to that muscle memory in sports. And see, the reason for muscle memory isn't so that way, you know, you just do a better job when you're playing. It's so when you're in the intensity of the moment, where you're having to make split-second decisions, when you're surrounded and you don't know what to do and you just have to shoot it, your, your, your body just acts on its own. You don't have to think your body just knows what to do because you have pounded it into your mind. You have pounded it into your body. Your muscles, your bones, your tendons literally remember the action that you did hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. If anyone ever is into basketball like I am, uh, I'm a Spurs fan, so we just like won the, literally the lottery. Does anyone here watch basketball? One, yes. <laughs> Are you a Bulls fan? Yeah. Yeah. You, you had your time. Wow. <laughs> so, now's a good time to become a Spurs fan. Just so you know. No, no. <laughs> Everyone hates us. Um, anyways. But yeah, so if you ever like watch like a basketball team and they talk about practice, it's insane what they do. They're like, oh, I practiced the shot. And I have to, I practice it a thousand times. A thousand shots of practice. And it's just like, what? How do you, how do you do it? How do you do that? Why do you do that? Do you actually get that much better at it? And it's just no. It's just, you just do it over and over and over. From every place. So that way when it happens, you just do it. In fact, even if we resist trying to be bound by our memory. Our brains actually won't allow it. Our brains will not let us let go of our memories, especially the hard and painful ones. In fact, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is exactly that. It is our bodies refusing to let go of a painful experience, to let go of a, of a moment of fear, a moment of pain, a moment of brokenness. And our bodies is responding in to those traumatic memories. And we can't do anything about it. And it takes years and years of intense, uh, intentional uh, working out our minds and working out our bodies in order to eventually retrain the brain to not be acting on those memories. I have a, I have a good friend. Uh, he, he, his name is Ben Sledge. He just came out with a, a book uh, where, 
which were, were boys go to die, I think it is. He was, he, he was in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, but he t was telling me, I knew him when he, shortly after he came back, and he was telling me that like during, he could not like go outside during like the 4th of July. And that he told me a story one time that a firework went off at a barbecue, and he was with his uh, girlfriend at the time, and his instinctual thing was to throw her to the ground and then reach for a pistol that wasn't there to save her. Why? Because he had lost friends. He had had to save people before. And his brain, even though he knew he was in Texas and not in Iraq, not in Afghanistan, he knew he was at a barbecue and he knew it was just a firework and not an IED, not a rocket, and yet the memory in his body just would not let him forget. I think if we really sat down and thought through it, we would see that memory, whether it be our conscious memory, our unconscious memory, or our subconscious memory, often uh, plays the conductor of our lives. It's this very, very subtle thing that we don't always realize. Because we tend to, well, we tend to react. We tend to react and not respond. You see, reacting is we just go with our gut instinct. Whatever it is you just feel like you need to do, you just react to it. And almost always when we react to things, we like break it. But when we respond, what's going on is we are stopping and thinking about the situation. We are reflecting on what's happening. And then we choose an action based off of that. I'm sure if you've ever been in a fight with your spouse, we know the difference between reacting and responding. It's the difference between uh, having to sleep on the couch uh, and sleeping in the bed that night. Because in one of them, you were just reacting out of whatever fear, anxiety, insecurity, frustration that has been built up within you, but responding allows you to address the actual situation. Thus the importance of reflection. But memory, interesting enough, even though we build our entire lives and it rules us in our actions, strangely enough, memory is notoriously sketchy and untrustworthy. Memory is notoriously untrustworthy. As soon as something happens, almost instantly our brains start to rearrange the events that happen and make changes. This is why if you, are, if you are like me and you like law and order or you've ever been to a trial, you know that eyewitness testimony is essentially like useless. Like if you, if you have a case and you only have eyewitness testimony, you're probably not going to win. And it's because prosecutors know that eyewitness accounts, uh, their memories are unreliable, biased, and malleable. It can change. And in fact, people have been known to convince themselves and gain memories of something happening that never actually happened. Like there's actually people out there who, who have real memories and they've convinced themselves that they have killed somebody or hurt somebody. And they have the memories and they feel it and they turn themselves in and the cops investigate and it just didn't happen. They didn't hurt anybody. They didn't kill anybody. Nothing happened, but they've convinced it and they can... See the memories playing in their mind just like a movie. Our brains are extremely susceptible to change. One particular study uh, powerfully demonstrates this. Uh, on 9-11, a researcher in what is called flashbulb memory, which is like these big events that you think you, know, you would never forget, like 9-11. I think most of us who were uh, alive during 9-11 we remember it quite vividly, and we know exactly where we were and what happened. And so this flashbulb researcher, they decided to throw together a study, and that week, they went and asked 3,000 people in New York a series of questions, just very basic questions. Uh, where were you that morning? How did you feel? Who were you with? And stuff like that. And every couple of years, what they would do is they would go back to those people, they would go back to the people that they asked, 
And they would ask all the same information again. Who were you with? Where were you? How did you feel? What was going on? All of that. Now surely, like I said, everyone who was alive during 9-11, certainly you would think you would never forget anything going on in that, right? Like it was such a powerful moment. You would never, that the, especially if you were in New York on that day, you would not forget as you were the one watching it unfold. However, pretty much everyone in that study, after only one year, the story radically changed. And in fact, about 20% of their memories were different. 20% changed in their memory. And every year after that, it was less changed. But 3 to 6%, every year, the memory changes. In fact, what would happen is the person who would fill out the questionnaire, what would happen, they would be interviewed, and they would be told, hey, the, the, what you're saying now is different than what you said last year. And they would look at it, and they'd be like, I didn't write that. And they would be like, is that your handwriting? They'd be like, yeah, it's my handwriting, but I didn't write it. Because their memories are so strong in what they remember now that literally when confronted with the truth of what they actually said happened that week, they couldn't accept it. And the biggest victim of our memory, the biggest victim of our fluctuation of memory is our emotions and our feelings. It's easy to remember where you were. But almost instantly, our brain forgets how we felt in that moment. And this is, is what is most deadly for our spirituality if we don't cultivate a discipline of Selah. I say all this because if we struggle to passively, you know, remember big life-altering events, and we, those memories change and we can't have the proper perspective on it. How are we going to remember the big, little, hidden, or mysterious things God has done for us in our lives? As I said at the beginning, good stuff bounces off us like Teflon. Negative things stick to us like Velcro. So we are more likely to remember the bad and our memory is so fickle that we change and don't remember how we feel when the Lord provides for us, when the Lord does good things for us, chances are we're going to very quickly forget what that feels like. It's going to be very easy to fall back into the darkness, to fall back into the memories of pain, the memories of frustration, of struggle, of fear, of anxiety. How are we going to remember what, is like, what it is like to be loved by God in certain times when our feelings and our emotions are the first thing our brains let go of? We can't. It's impossible. We cannot just walk in our life with God, have good things happen to us, and then just continue on and then hope that the next time something bad happens, we remember that good time again. We just won't. It's just not how our brains function. Now, I know I struggle with this. I, I, I have a tendency to you know, get depressed, to isolate, to struggle, to ruminate on all the things, and I catastrophize everything, and I just torment my wife with it because I always, like, whenever something happens, something bad happens, like, I'm not just thinking about the bad thing that happened. I'm thinking about literally the impossible things that I think could happen. And I sit there and I go through like every, like until I get to the floor, like, and then if aliens invade, what's gonna happen? And it's just like, whoa, 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 whoa. And I just fall into this negativity, this darkness, this fear, forgetting anything that the Lord has ever shown me in the past, forgetting any time the Lord said to you, you do not need to fear, you can trust me. It's all gone. I struggle with this so much. I am horrible with that. I'm a lot like uh, Peter in Erica's sermon last week. If you were here, she rocked it, and I wish she was in here so we could give her another round of applause. But I'm a lot like Peter in her sermon last week. I look at the waves instead of looking at Christ, and I easily drown. 
And when my circumstances get hard, I have to be intentional of letting myself get taken away by the tide of fear and worry. I have to be intentional in not letting myself get caught up in the negativity. If I personally wait, and I have a feeling most of us in here it's the same, if I wait till, uh, until the difficulty comes, then it is hard to recover, and it is so easy to fall into the lie that God does not have us, that he is not in control, that he doesn't love or care enough to save us, and that we are all on our own. And it's that last one. It is that last one that is most deadly. When we forget the goodness of God, our instinct is, I'm in this on my own. And we rely on ourselves, and we fall into a survival mindset. But if we, during the good times, if we, when times are okay, when all is well and there's nothing to worry about, when we can never even picture something bad might happening, if instead of just, you know, coasting through life in this time, if we are intentional, if we are intentional in remembering and showing gratitude and taking itinerary, of the good things that God has done. If we focus on Jesus, if we marvel at the wonders of the Lord, then we will be much more prepared when the hard times come. If we stop and marvel, if we sail at the glory of the Lord, we may still sink, we may still struggle, and we may still be afraid and uncertain and anxious. And we may still need to be saved by God. But in the end, we know that when we remember, even if we start to sink, we are so inundated. Our, our, that muscle memory that I was talking about, of just the muscle memory in our brain of the glory of the Lord is so inbuilt into us that even if we're afraid, we know that we can trust God. The same way that a basketball player can trust their jumper, that a hockey player can trust their shot, that any athlete can trust their muscle memory. Why? Because they practiced over and over and over. Practice is easy. Playoffs are hard. And if you're not ready, you can get overwhelmed. And it's the same thing with us. We can't just look for the goodness of God when things are hard. We have to do it when things are good. Constantly remind ourselves. And so in the Psalms, our Psalm in Psalm 77, it's seven, Psalm 77 is called a Psalm of Lament. If you've uh, never really dug into the Psalms before, the Psalms are essentially like the very first prayer book slash hymnal. This is what the church would sing and pray through, and in fact, uh, a lot of the early Christians, they would try to pray through all the psalms like every week. It was like the primary place they would go to for worship, and Psalm 77 is a lament, which means they crying out to God. Believe it or not, yes, you can cry out to God when things are hard. You're allowed to go to him and say, Lord, everything's messed up. I don't know what to do. Where are you? What am I supposed to do? And we are allowed to go before the Lord and just unload our burdens and our pain and our difficulty. God can handle it. And what the psalmist says in this, in this lament, he, said, he wonders if God's love has ceased forever. If he has taken back his promises, if his grace and compassion has been removed. Imagine that being in your prayer. Lord, have you forgotten that you promised me? Lord, have you ceased to love me? God, are you going to rescue me as you promised? We're allowed to make those prayers. We are allowed to make those prayers. But the psalmist's answer to that, after making those prayers, after reaching out to the Lord with his pain and his suffering and bearing his broken heart before him, he decides to not just sit there and ruminate 
on how hard everything is. He doesn't catastrophize. He doesn't define himself by that. Instead, what he does is he stops. He recognizes that his memory is not great, that his natural humility, humanity is fickle and makes him question God's actions. And so he does what we all need to do. He does a sailor. He stops ruminating and calls to mind all the good things of God. He stops and takes itinerary so that even in the face of God's silence, the psalmist may rest on God's provision that will only be at the forefront of his mind if he consciously chooses to meditate. We also see this in Philippians, in our one verse in there, where Paul exhorts the church to do a profound exercise of meditation. I'll just read again real quick. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Now, oftentimes, when I grew up, I grew up in the South, so they're they, they a little hardcore about some things. But I was told that what this verse was about was, like, don't watch R-rated movies, because that's not thinking about an excellent thing. Or don't listen to, like, heavy music, which is what I love, because that's not an excellent thing. That's not a commendable thing. But that's not what Paul's saying here. Paul's not talking about the things we consume. All of the things we consume do have an effect on us, but he's not saying this to be like, hey, you're not allowed to like enjoy things. He's not talking about the external things. He specifically says, think about these things. This is not an external exercise of the entertainment we consume. It's an internal exercise of what it is we're meditating on. And I, I just love that Paul does this. Paul here is saying to start first, before all things, with our thought life. To start with meditating on the excellence of God. Paul, in his own way, is telling the church of Philippi to Selah. To meditate on what is good. To meditate on what is loving. To meditate on what is righteous and holy. Bless you. Paul is telling us to slow down, to pay attention, to meditate on the works, deeds, and promises of God. Because if we do not discipline our heart, if we do not gain that spiritual muscle memory when, uh, about God's goodness, when things are going well or normally, then we will be destroyed when trials come. If we do not always remember and stop, if we don't always stop and remember that we are loved, Remember the feeling of being loved, protected, cared for, seen, then we will all forget it. And Satan wants nothing more. It's nothing more than for us to forget that we are unconditionally, immensely, and infinitely loved. There's nothing more that Satan wants than for us to think that we are alone. That we're in this all of us by ourselves. That there's nowhere to go to forget the promises of the Lord. So instead, we need to be intentional with our thought lives. We need to remind ourselves of the good things of God. So that way when the trials come, when the storm enters our life, because life happens, we all know this. Some of us in here know it much more than others, but life happens. And our hearts, our integrity, our spirituality, our character, our trust and faith and all of that good stuff, that stuff isn't defined when everything is perfect and good. That stuff is defined when everything has gone wrong. 
when you are saying those prayers. Lord, have you ceased to love me? Lord, have you forgotten your promises? Lord, where are you? It is in those moments that not only are our hearts created, our purity created, but our true relationship with God is seen and built and shown. So I ask you something I don't normally ask, a very practical thing. I just ask one thing for you to take away from this. And that is, I want you to become a list maker. Does anyone here love making lists? Good. So you guys will have it easy. Everyone else, I'm sorry, this will be like an actual discipline for you. But I promise it will be a good one. I want you to become a list maker of the things of gratitude. The things that God has done that you love. Those of us who are in the Tuesday and Thursday life group. Uh, we, in our book, The Good and Beautiful God, this is actually the exercise he tells us to do, and I wanted to do it because I am awful at gratitude. As I said, I so easily panic and get anxious and ruminate and just get thrown into chaos, and so I have been trying every day during my morning prayers, uh, in my morning scripture reading, I always, I've been trying to do this discipline where I stop and I have this ongoing list, and I read it, reading all the things that I'm thankful for God for, that I'm gracious for, the mighty works God has done in my life, and then I add stuff to it. I pray, and I think, Lord, what am I thankful for today? Lord, what's a wonder you have shown me that I am glad I saw? And it's just two things. First of all, I now have a list that when things get hard, I can go to and I can remember. But then also, every day I am returning to that list. Every day I am training and teaching my heart of the goodness, beauty, and love of God. So that way, when the time comes, I will be able to stand much more secure. I hope. I'm really bad at this making. But the goal is, is that as we work, as we go, as we train our heart, we can have a posture of gratitude. We can have a posture of looking at the excellence and beauty and goodness of God. So that we, when the hard stuff happens, when it hits the fan, we can stand in peace instead of chaos. We can stand in strength instead of fear. We can stand in love instead of anxiety. The fourth century uh, bishop, John Christossum, says this, happiness can only be achieved by looking inward and learning to enjoy whatever life has. And this requires transforming greed into gratitude. Now, he's talking about money, but we can use the same thing with everything else. To transform our lives, which are so often focused on ourselves, focused on our desires, focused on all the things we have to do, all the busyness of life, all the things we want, all the things we desire. But when we instead take our eyes off ourselves, our intellectual, internal eyes, and we put it on God and how good God is, the wonders God has done, those we have seen, those that we have read, those that we have heard of. And that becomes our main foundation. Our lives will be one of joy. And here's the beautiful thing. This practice of gratitude, this practice of remembering, of fortifying our memories, of stopping and looking at the mightiness, glory, and works of God does something else as well. It prepares us for the new creation. It prepares us for what is called the beatific vision of God. Beatific vision essentially means witnessing and seeing the full unfiltered, uninhibited glory of God. You know how Jesus said no one has seen the Father? 
beatific vision is when we are all in union with God and we will all see the Father in his glory. We will all meditate and behold on the, and contemplate of God in his full goodness. You see, when we meditate on the mightiness and goodness of God now, we are tapping in to the beatific vision of God in the future. When God restores all things and reconciles the universe to himself, when we are brought into loving union with God, it will be an unending witness and contemplation of his goodness. We will only know the mighty works. We will only know the good deeds. We will only know the wonders of God. Because we will be in perfect love and vision of him. And we need not, we need not to remember God, we need not to wait to do that. In that new creation, we will not need to remember to stop and meditate on how good God is. We will not need to remind ourselves of his wonders because we will be unable to escape them. We will always be seeing them. We will always know the wonders and glory of God intimately. And see, when we are meditating today, in this life, when we are meditating on God's works, when we are musing on his deeds, we are actually practicing now what we will be enjoying for all eternity. The overwhelming joy of being a witness to God's unmediating, perfect, loving glory. This is what we say when we, when we say to walk in the kingdom of God. To participate in the kingdom. What it means that when the Holy Spirit, when Christ died and resurrected, when death was defeated, and the presence of the Lord entered us, we have access to God and his fullness. We can join in now what we will only gain in full in the future. And so when we meditate, when we say a lot, when we do what the psalmist says, we are not just tricking our mind into thinking happy thoughts. We're actually bridging heaven and earth. We are bringing together the two realms which have been split apart, the spiritual and the physical. And this only happens when we meditate, when we focus on the glory and goodness of So I ask you, so that the worship team can come forward. So as I said, very simple message, but I guarantee you it's a powerful exercise. I ask you to join in with the psalmist. Join in with what the Apostle Paul has to say. Focus our mind. Don't just remind yourself of the good things when things get hard. Focus and glorify God. Meditate and give, give, give thanksgiving now. Build that spiritual muscle memory. So that way, whenever anything happens, good, bad, ugly, your heart will have that memory. Your heart will. Even if your mind doesn't, your heart will remember, and you will put your faith and trust in God. Let us now, we are now going to join together in the sacrament of communion. This sacrament is a remembering of the good works of God. Remembering the mighty deeds of our Lord and Savior. That God, though he is God, became man and walked among us.
took on our flesh, bore our pain, bore our sins, went through every trial and temptation we go through just so he could know us, just so he could save us. It is in communion where we remember this, where we celebrate and meditate on the good deeds and wonders of the Lord. And so I ask, as we come forward and take communion, let it be a true memory. Let it be a Selah, where you are just stopping and pausing, because this is important. This is a moment to remember and hold in your heart as a mighty deed of the Lord. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Let us pray. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory. And we feast on his heavenly banquet. Amen. May come forward and take communion. We have gluten-free options over here. If you need it, come forward. Take communion with the Lord. of Christ broken. Thank you for the amazing gift you have given us. We thank you that you have given us a chance to be reconciled, to know your love, to know your glory, to know your might. And may this communion be a true memory, a forming memory that sticks in our heart, that is inscribed on our mind. So that as we go out into this world, as we walk among each other, then we know that we are always walking with you. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us stand together and sing our final song. Darkness deepens, Lord. 
peace, love, and vision of our Lord. 